the first question that we have for right now is how do you balance taking care of loved ones and taking care of yourself? This is so annoying. So I know there's many incredible sessions that are happening, and so I know that it's we want to try to pack in as much as we can. But I think this is a very important question, and for the questioner, we'll try to give the answer, inshallah. How do you balance taking care of yourself and also taking care of your family and your loved ones? You know, there's an exercise that we often do in some of the smaller workshops um, when we talk about this topic. And I often ask people to close their eyes and make a list of all the people that they care for. Most of the audience, when I ask them who was on that list, will raise their hands and say, my parents, my children, my siblings, uh, my, my family members, my friends, my neighbors. And yet, usually, nine out of 10 of the people that are there will not include themselves on that list. We don't make it to the list. We get so busy with the taking care of everyone else that we forget that we ourselves have a right upon ourselves. So finding that balance. Again, it's not going to be in a spa day necessarily. It might, maybe for a few minutes, being able to step away. But that can't be that one solution, that getting away as the idea. Taking care of the self is a process that exists within ourselves. It's a process of being able to mentally step away from the stresses and the difficulties of our day to day, to mentally take a few minutes to ground ourselves. We often teach a method known as anxiety grounding, also known as the 54321 method. And it's a method of mindfulness, of being able to bring yourself back in the moment it takes just a few minutes to accomplish. And in those few minutes, you're able to step away from what it is that is occupying your mind and that's pulling you away from being able to take care of yourself. So rather than looking at taking care of yourself as an external activity that requires a great deal of time and effort, if we change that, that process, that cognitive restructuring, and think of it instead as an internal exercise, something that we can engage in, and anxiety grounding is one technique that helps in that way, that we can engage in, that can help us in that process of caring for ourselves by showing ourselves self-compassion. And I would, again, I'm a bit biased, but I would definitely recommend speaking to a counselor speaking to a therapist, learning how to incorporate these elements of mindfulness and being present within yourself rather than seeking external distractions, because often that's all the external is. Our next question is, you mentioned it's painful when our salah has no meaning. How do we give it meaning uh, and learn to love doing salah? So first thing, don't stop. Don't stop. Even if it feels ritualistic, even if it feels habitual, even if you're standing in your salah and you're squeezing it in between you know, a million other things, don't stop. Because it's when we stop that we lose sight of that connection that we may have. So if you're standing in your prayer and your mind is moving in a million different directions. Something we mentioned earlier needs to happen. Mindfulness, being present, and it is usually an outcome of our difficulty in detaching in our day-to-day. -day. And so even for those few minutes that we're standing in Salah, it's so hard to detach from what occupies us, and so the anxiety will sometimes increase rather than decreasing in those moments. But if for every 10 salahs, for every 20 salahs, for every 30 salahs, you have one salah in which you feel a connection, then that's worth it. Because that may be the salah that enters you into Jannah, inshallah. So keep trying, keep doing it, 
don't dismiss it. Don't ever demean what you are doing for the sake of Allah. Allah knows your tests. He knows your struggle. He knows that you stand in salah and you want to be closer to Him. You yearn to be closer to Him. But sometimes you can't do it. But you keep trying and keep doing it. And inshallah, that faraj will come. You will have those moments of connection. Savor those, hold on to those. And inshallah, they'll be replicated in each of your salahs. Our third question is, how do you respond when people make you feel bad for taking care of yourself? Okay. Great question. How do you respond to people making you feel bad for taking care of yourself? So again, I think we have to really understand that taking care of ourselves looks different for each of us. As we mentioned earlier, for some of us, it really does look like a spa day. We really do need to physically step away from everything and, and just enter into that space of seclusion that isn't necessarily tahajjud. And again, our deen is a deen of yusr, not asr. Yes, tahajjud is a path towards connecting with Allah. Yes, tahajjud is a spiritual elevation for many of us. But there are times when we stand up for tahajjud and we can't do it. There are times when our bodies are so tired and so broken that we need to sleep. And so self-care may look like sleep for one person. It may look like a spa day for another person. It may look like you know uh, going to an amusement park and riding roller coasters for another person. It may look like spending time with your children for another person. So recognizing that there will always be people judging there will always be people commenting because we fear differences. If for me, my place of seclusion, my self-care comes in the form of, you know, of my salah, for example, I may see someone else whose self-care looks like the spa day and think, Psh, you're wasting time, you should wake up and pray. But in that moment, that person who went for the self-care spa day may be more elevated in Allah Azza wa Jal's eyes than the person who just denounced them and put them down. Because that denouncement comes from a place of ego. And we know that if we have a mustard seed's weight of ego in our hearts, we will not enter Jannah. May Allah protect us from that. So dismiss it. And know that that person who's judging you may have just handed over some of their good deeds to you. And do what you need to do. As long as you are consulting your heart and you are recognizing that what you are doing is not displeasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. And don't clap so we can get more questions in, okay? <laughs> Our next question is, um, I have been going to therapy, but my parents keep asking why I need it and if it's worth it. How do I explain without sharing too much? I love this question. <laughs> I love this question. I cannot tell you how many times in our centers we will have people who may, you know, have a, a an issue where, you know, they come in, maybe they've got, you know, a, a, a bag, a purse that costs a thousand dollars. They're wearing shoes that cost, you know, a couple hundred dollars. They, and, you know, after they're done with their session, they're like, oh, you know, it's really pricey. You know, I don't think I can pay the, you know, the $45 or the $50 for this session because we don't value the importance of seeking that guidance, seeking that advice, and seeking that counsel. But when we look to our own deen, we see that the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the foremost counselor. He was the advisor for his people. People would go to him and ask him questions and say, I am feeling sad. I am feeling like I'm going through difficulty. Who can forget the youth? who went to the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, I want to commit zina, I want to fornicate. And the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him that advice, that guidance. He listened to him. He got him to understand what this means. And essentially, this is the role of the counselor today as well. So if your parents are averse to it or they feel like they don't understand the need for it, ask them to come to a session. Ask them to sit with you and maybe have a family session where you can all talk through things. See how they react. Because many times it's what we don't know that we can't attach value to. And many times it's the thought that, well, I can talk to a friend, I can talk to you know, my, my roommate, I can talk to my parents, but it's not the same. 
So I would say try to get your parents engaged. I mean, one thing that we do at Cornerstone at our centers is when there is a resistant person, many times we'll get um, spouses, uh, wives, who will come to the office and will say, I have this problem, this problem, this problem, but my husband refuses to come in. And many times we'll call up the husband and we'll say, listen, you know, your, your wife is here and we need to help her with her emotional uh, uh, difficulty and improve her relational well-being, but we can't do it without you. Would you be willing to come in? And once we get them through the door, they're scheduling more sessions than their wives are. So many times it's about getting your parents to be exposed to what is the process of counseling so that they can also understand how it does help their children. So we're going to end it with just an announcement, and then you guys can enjoy the rest of your day, inshallah.